Welcome to Small Business 21st Century and today's segment of Build Your Difference. My name is Pierre Walters. I'm a qualified brand and business consultant and over the last 15 years, I've helped thousands of individual entrepreneurs and business owners build successful operations, launch growth-oriented digital marketing campaigns, and establish memorable brands. And throughout it all, I've encountered obstacles, challenges, and countless rejections. But I've also learned a simple truth that all of us can use to build stronger businesses and engage more customers. You see, when you find out that you've been rejected by potential customers, it can be a tough pill to swallow. However, if you're persistent and take the time to understand why they refused your offer, you'll be able to move forward and find quality new customers. You see, the same principle applies to any other challenge you might face. I'll share the strategies that helped me overcome those challenges and how you can use them to build a stronger business. But first, let's start by understanding more about the challenge we all face. What is customer rejection? <laughs> okay, well, customer rejection is when a potential customer refuses an offer. It can be due to a variety of factors, including, but not limited to, the following. Unfavorable perception, unsatisfactory experience, an unsatisfactory build or, or construction, the wrong price, or simply too high of quality, you know, not meeting their needs or expectations. Let's talk about the unfavorable perception. What does that mean? Well, an unfavorable perception can be defined as unfavorable information that a customer has about your business or your service. The key is to determine what this perception is so you can change it. Here are some examples. You are a cheap company, <laughs> or you're not qualified to do the job. Well, let, let's look at some, some, some actions you might wanna take to change this perception. Number one, you wanna find out why the customer has such a bad impression of your business or your service. Number two, you wanna identify what the perception is and use that information to make a plan for how you're going to change it. But what if the customer has had an unsatisfactory experience with your service, maybe your product or, or similar service or product in the past? Well, the first thing you wanna do is ask the customer why they had that experience. And number two, if you can't determine what the problem was, ask the customer to help you. And number three, use the results of that investigation to make a plan for how you're going to fix it. Now, sometimes a customer can sense that the overall quality of the product or service is simply inadequate for their tastes. Sometimes that assessment is based on images or a, a reputation. And in that scenario, what do you do? Well, Number one, you ask the customer if they would be willing to change their mind about what you do. Number two, if you can't determine what is wrong, ask the customer to help you. And number three, use the results of that investigation to make a plan for how you're going to fix it. As we've said before, a customer could also choose to reject your offer if the price is simply not right. And in that scenario, you're in a bit of a pickle. You have to make the offer, but if they reject it, you can't go back. So what do you do? Well, one way to handle this is to consider a variety of options that can allow entry to your offer from many different price points. One of the most common things that customers do is to pick a product and then select an option that they don't want. This happens a lot, say, in grocery stores. So understanding how to handle rejection is critical. By offering different price points with adjustments to the value, you're showing the customer that you recognize their need to find the right price without jeopardizing the integrity of what you have to offer. 
A form of rejection that isn't often discussed is rejection due to the overqualification of your service or product. And when a customer rejects you for this reason, you must show them that you understand their need to see the value of your offering. It's perhaps even more critical that you show them that they deserve the level of quality that you're offering. A common phrase is, hey, if you buy it cheap, you're going to replace it often. Some examples of this might include, say, a low-cost computer that is running really slowly right out the box, or a watch that you didn't spend very much on and only works for a year or two. In the long run, you see, it can be more expensive to consider anything less than the quality that you're offering. So, as you can see, there are a variety of reasons that a customer can find for rejection, and also a variety of ways that you can learn from each experience. But how do, you, how do you move forward pushing through those no's to get to those yeses? What's the secret to keep momentum and motivation as you introduce more and more people to what you have to offer? Well, the secret is building a community. You see, by building a community, you gain the ability to share the good news with others. You can be counted on to help someone out if they're having trouble getting their product or service out or overcoming obstacles in their path. You see, community is what both supports and drives your momentum. Building a community is not just about offering your services or products. It's about sharing good news and sharing the information that you've learned as you have been along the way doing what it is that you do best. So how does this work on a practical level? Well, how does building a community around your business help you to push through the no's to get to the yeses? Well, <laughs> here are three really good reasons. Number one, it keeps you motivated when times get tough or when you're feeling a little down Having a community to interact with can keep you going. And it's always rewarding when someone else says, hey, <laughs> I love what you're doing, and starts asking questions. Now, number two, it helps to get feedback. Feedback from people that are actually in the trenches with you and can tell you what is working for them and simply what isn't, and, and that sort of thing. The two main reasons why I love having a community for my business are that it keeps me motivated and gives me a constant stream of feedback. And number three, it shows you that your tribe is out there, and it's just a numbers game to discover them all. A numbers game. Now, have you heard that term before? What does it mean? A numbers game. A numbers game. See, that's shorthand. That's a shorthand way of saying that there's a mathematical or statistical likelihood of finding your yeses across a certain number of no's. If you stay persistent in reaching your no's, the goal then you'll almost by accident discover your yeses. And guess what? There are no shortcuts to that. It's just about being there and connecting with people. All businesses, all businesses are about acquiring customers. And the best way to do that is by attending events and talking to people face to face. So how do you play this numbers game? Well, you need to focus on having the best possible start. The way you do that is by being passionate and authentic in the way that you speak to people, engage with them, and get them to give you a little bit of their time. You can't fake passion. Plus, if you're excited about what you have to offer, your authenticity will be on display. It will attract those who can sense that you're genuine and what you believe is what you're advocating. You make it a goal to talk to 10 potential customers every week. Now that means just two customers on Monday, on Tuesday, just two customers on Wednesday, 
on Thursday and just two customers on Friday. Now you might find that 10% of the people that you talk to express further interest. That's one out of 10 and that is a great start. So getting through your no's to find your yeses is the heart of growing your business. It's the heart of sales and it has everything to do with the number of people you can provide with a quality discussion. One of the things I often see new businesses struggling with in sales is how they approach and play that numbers game. How they manipulate potential customers and how they create artificially pressurized situations. You see, bad sales tactics can cost you a lot of money, both now and in the long term by way of reputation. And these are some of the most common and costly mistakes in selling. When you know what to do and what not to do, you can avoid these traps, such as pricing too high or too low. Can, doing that can alienate potential buyers and cut into your profits. Now, another one might be focusing on the wrong products. That may lead to neglecting higher margin items. Another common mistake is ignoring the customer's feedback. That can result in missed opportunities to actually improve your sales. And of course, my personal favorite, not being organized. You see, <laughs> not being organized affects your efficiency and that can lead to wasted time and resources. Now, another one that people don't often think about is failing to create a sales plan before any meeting. Have a plan because that means that you have specific goals to strive for. And last but not least, when you're finishing a conversation, you want to have a good closing technique because not having a good closing technique improperly closing can cost you that sale. You always want to remember failing to personalize the experience, that can cost you because being honest with customers is important to creating trust and that results in more sales. Now, are you ready? Are you ready to optimize your numbers game and start gaining those yeses? When we come back, I'll dive into each of these sales traps and help you maneuver your way to more customers and a greater, stronger community. Stay with us. Minds can achieve anything. We make sure they get to college. Federal Student Aid provides more than $150 billion in grants, loans, and work-study funds to make college possible for anyone with a mind to get there. Because if given the chance, minds will do great things. Federal Student Aid, proud sponsor of the American Mind. Learn more about money for college at studentaid.gov. Welcome back to Small Business 21st Century and today's segment of Build Your Difference. My name is Pierre Walters and in this episode, we're discussing the strategies that you'll need to gain more customers for your business while building a larger community. To do this, we want to outline some of the most common sales traps business owners face and how to overcome them. And before the break, we took a look at seven of the most common sales traps and to recap, they are number one, pricing too high or too low because that can alienate potential buyers and cut into your profits. Number two, focusing on the wrong products because that can lead to neglecting the higher margin items. Number three, ignoring customer feedback because that can result in missed opportunities that could actually improve your sales. Number four, not being organized. That affects efficiency and it can lead to wasted time and resources. Number five, failing to create a sales plan. That means that not having a specific goal to strive for can cost you. Number six, closing techniques. You see, if you don't close the conversation right, you might actually lose the sale. <laughs> and number seven, failing to personalize the experience. 
being honest with customers is important because that creates trust. And it's trust that will earn you more sales. Now, you might be wondering, with traps like these, to which most business owners and salespeople succumb, how exactly are we supposed to overcome and gain the customers that we actually need? My answer? Well, it's very simple. Two words. Don't lie. Okay, actually four words. Don't make up sales. Okay, wait. <laughs> actually, maybe six words. Don't embellish your product or services. Okay, actually, let's just sum it up this way. Don't be afraid to ask customers questions and listen carefully to the answers that they give you because, you see, the truth is that the customer knows what it's right. They, they know what's right for them, even if they don't seem to know right away. And if you can ask the right questions, they will actually tell you. This is, after all, the whole purpose of marketing and sales, to help people make decisions that are in their own best interest. Asking questions allows you to get to know your customers better and gain their trust. You see, it's all about gaining trust. The right kind of trust. The trust in your authentic self and the promise of your service or your product. Because when you're working through the no's to find those yeses, what you're really doing is looking for the customers who will offer you repeat business. The customers who fall in love with your brand and who will share it with their friends. The customers who are so happy with your product or your service that they want to tell their friends about it too. These customers become your best advocates. They become your brand ambassadors, driving traffic to your website and filling the seats at your events. You see, the secret is that when you push past the crowded no's and secure those yeses, you're building a powerful community, true fans. There's a term that I want to introduce you to. It's, it's called 1,000 true fans. And what it means is that if you can get 1,000 people to buy into your product or services and become true fans, then you've got an audience of over 10 thousand people. And at that point, you're starting to form a truly successful company. And why is that? Well, consider that each fan is vocally connected to 10 additional people. And when they believe in your product or service, they're going to make trusted recommendations to the 10 people in their circle. And if just one of the 10 people they introduce decides to buy into your authentic promise, then you've just doubled your audience from 10,000 to 20,000. In other words, you can double your audience by simply leveraging the power of social proof. So what is social proof? Well, social proof is the power of your audience to spread the word about your product or service. Word of mouth. See, well, okay, well, word of mouth, on the other hand, is a secondary method of spreading the word. So what are the differences between social proof and word of mouth? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's talk about the power of social proof. Say you're on an online dating site, and you have thousands, thousands of people who are members on your site. Say you own the site, and you've got thousands of members who are on your site. Now, you can go to Twitter, and you can say, hey, <laughs> there are 10,000 people on my dating site. That is social proof. Your potential clients will see that 10,000 other people are already using your product. And that is a powerful form of social proof. But a lot of people don't realize that social proof is the power of numbers. The number 10,000 isn't really what's important here. What's important is how many other people are just simply using your product or service. Social proof is powerful. Now, say you're a physician 
And you want to treat someone for a disease. Now, you can go on Twitter and you can say, hello, I'm Dr. Smith and I'm treating a cancer patient or I'm open to treating cancer patients. Now, that's social proof, right? Well, of course, you can't actually say, hey, I'm treating cancer patients. You see, if you want to be cured, you got to come see me, right? No, 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 no. You have to be very careful about how you use social proof when you're talking about your product or service. Going out and finding those yeses, those fans, is the most important thing that you can do. Because if you can adopt the mindset that you'll find one fan for every 10 people, then what you want to do is make a plan to target 10 times the amount of people that you know you're going to need. The best plans are the ones that divide the total number across days or weeks. And that, well, after they've done that, they've then set goals to meet those numbers. For example, let's say my goal for the month was 100 new customers or fans. To reach that goal, I need to multiply the number 100 times 10. Now that would be 1,000 people. Now, since one month has four weeks, I'm going to divide 1,000 people into four weeks. That's 250 people each week. Now, you may be thinking, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to connect with 250 people every single week? Well, let's divide our weekly goal of 250 people into a daily goal, Monday through Friday, of just 50 people. Now, does reaching 50 people a day sound overwhelming to you? Does that sound plausible? Well, it may not if you're thinking about phone calls. But think about tools like social media, especially tools like LinkedIn. Imagine targeting just 50 people from your LinkedIn network. Maybe that means sending each of them a personalized message. That's much, much more reasonable, isn't it? You see, if we take 50 people and divide that by eight hours in the day, we're actually looking at just six people every hour. <laughs> Now see this, this is fun. Six people an hour is the same as one person every 10 minutes. Imagine what kind of impact you can have if you focused on writing a personalized message to just one person every 10 minutes on LinkedIn for a single day. And if you did that every day for just one week and every week for just one month, the likelihood of you reaching your 1,000 person connection goal is so much more realistic. And the possibility of you reaching those 100 true fans, those 100 yeses, is now infinitely more likely and realistic. You see, it's a numbers game. And you can play it. And with just a little bit of elbow grease and a lot of authentic and personalized discussions, you can win the businesses that you need, the fans that you want. Now imagine you achieve just 100 true fans in a single month. What happens when each of those fans tells the 10 people in their circle about your service? What happens when just one of those 10 people decide to try you out? Now you've doubled your true fans from 100 to 200, and again from 200 to 400, and again from 400 to 800, and once again from 800 to over 1,000. And that's the magic number, 1,000. You see, you can do it, and you can see just how practical and logical and relatively simple it can be. But it starts with you. And in many ways, it ends with you. So, pushing through the no's and getting those yeses is one of the most rewarding aspects of entrepreneurship. It's a daily challenge and it becomes more challenging every day. But as we work together to build community, we can team and we can learn and we can encourage each other. We can build each other up and we can find new ways to achieve impossible goals. And if you're taking 
the challenge to build just a thousand true fans for your business, let us know how you're doing it and if you've discovered a new way to effectively and honestly reach your goal every single day. You see, you can learn more or share your story by following the information that's at the bottom of your screen right now. Finding your true fans is one of the most important aspects of building your business in today's market. And for small business, 21st century. My name is Pierre Walters, and I want to thank you for joining us on today's episode of Build Your Difference.